So we are going to take a few minutes to talk about First Thessalonians. But before we move on, I just got to give a shout out to Hannah Siegel, who's our students director here at Norfolk, who did all that artwork. And, uh, and to Kurt, our, our music and creative arts director who was just singing with us. He directed that whole thing and made it all possible and happen. And so um, that's awesome. We're excited to start this brand new series. And I'm excited to be in the, in the room with you today and, and do this live. If you're a little bit newer to the Norfolk campus, we often stream the message from another campus. And uh, that's actually a strategic decision. Uh, because when we were starting to think about multi-site church, which is one church in multiple locations, we have two campuses right now, one in Virginia Beach, one here in Norfolk. Uh, when we talked about like multiplying and starting a brand new location and community, we, we really wanted to make sure that the DNA of Grace Bible Church stayed with us. Uh, we felt like there was something so special about the grace and the humility and the teamwork that we saw all around us that we didn't want to lose that as we branched out. And so one of the ways we just figured, hey man, we can, we can make this happen, we can keep this going just by having all of us participate in the same message every week. And so typically um, we are going to stream that message until we all hear the same one, but about three, maybe four times a year, um, I love to just get to be with you here and, uh, and to speak to you as, as your campus pastor. And so um, one of those things that really does make Grace unique is uh, is our mission, and uh, one of, Grace Bible Church's mission uh, is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus, to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus, and uh, that's actually what I want to talk about with us today um, as we dive into the first 10 verses of First Thessalonians. I want to talk about our relationship with God. If you're a follower of Jesus, uh, you've started that relationship with God, you, you know what, what that's all about, you know that you want to grow, <laughs> You know that you want to take that next step. You want to get even closer to your Heavenly Father. And if, if you're here and you're, you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian, maybe you're just checking things out, someone invited you, I'm so glad that you are here, and I think today is going to be helpful for you uh, because we are going to be talking about how, how does this relationship with God work and how do you take next steps in it. And so if you're exploring what that might look like, it's going to be a great day uh, to be here. And uh, it's also why I'm glad that we're going to be talking about keystone habits, keystone habits. Um, Maybe you've heard this phrase, uh, keystone habit. Um, actually comes from a book that I read a few years ago called The Power of Habit by this gar guy, Charles Duhigg. What a great last name. Uh, the Power of Habit. It talks all about habits and how to form them. And this concept of a keystone habit comes up in the book. And it talks about, basically, a keystone habit is a habit that helps you do all the other habits <laughs> that you want to be doing. Um, so they, the, the big example they use is if you want to live a healthy life, there's lots of ways that you can do that, right? You, you can eat better, you can sleep better, but they said the keystone habit to living a more healthy life is actually exercise. If you figure out how to exercise, how to, how to do that consistently in your life and find that rhythm, then everything else is going to be way easier for you to do. When you exercise, you're much more likely to, to pick healthy food choices, you're much more likely to sleep better, um, and all these things kind of fall into place. That's, that's a keystone habit. And so anytime you're in a situation where you're like, I want to do all these 10 things, which one of them is the key to all the others? And uh, for me in my life, I've realized that the key to my sanity and the key to my like, mental health really is the keystone habit of waking up on time. <laughs> Waking up on time just changes everything. Like if I don't hit snooze, if I don't oversleep my alarm, um, but if I go to bed when I need to and when I wake up, then the, the morning is more peaceful and calm. I get to spend some time uh, praying and reading scripture, and uh, it's just better. I just feel better, uh, at least for me. And so that is a keystone habit in my life. And if I'm like kind of not feeling good or I'm in, in a bad mood or something's not going well, I got to recheck myself. Okay, how's, the, how's that fundamental thing going for me? And so the question becomes for us today, is there a keystone habit in our faith? Is there a keystone habit, something that kind of is at the bedrock, the baseline of everything else that we do in our faith, all the different ways we want to grow, all the different ways that we want to see ourselves take a step? Is there a keystone habit? Well, I think that actually this church in Thessalonica that we're going to be reading about from this letter uh, that we're studying over the next few weeks, we're going to learn that the Thessalonians found this keystone habit. They, they found what was, what was the thing that they needed to be doing in order to grow. And Paul celebrates that. And so we're going we're gonna to discover that together as we dive into these first few verses. And we're actually going to, uh, we're going to read all of chapter one today. It's 10 verses, but we're going to kind of skip around a little bit just to sort of see all the themes um, kind of go throughout. So we're going to dive in to 1 Thessalonians chapter one and find out what is this keystone 
have it. So the letter begins, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. So we see, starting off, there's these three guys, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who are writing to the church in, uh, of the Thessalonians. Now, if you, if you were able to catch it in that video, Paul, Silas, and Timothy were all at Thessalonica at one point, and they were helping plant this church that was starting to grow, and now they're away from that church. They actually got kicked out, um, and so they're writing back because they got a report about the Thessalonians. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of, of context, this is a map of where Thessalonica would have been uh, back in the day, right there on the northeast peninsula of Greece. Um, and I actually got to go to Thessalonica. It's actually still a, the Greek city Thessaloniki, um, is a present-day city on, on this port spot where Thessalonica was. And I actually want to show you a video real quick of, uh, of me walking at one of the highest points, looking out over the water with my finger in the way. Um, it's the only video I got of Thessalonica, and my finger is blocking most of it. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's Thessalonica, and, you, and it's actually still the second most populated city in, uh, in Greece to this day. Um, and so this is an important city, it's an important church, and so Paul heard this report about them, and he's actually heard that it's been going really well, that, that the Thessalonians are mature in their faith, that they're staying strong, even in the midst of all this craziness that's happening around them. And so he continues in verse 2, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Paul's thankful for them. Why, why is he thankful for them? He's thankful for them because Paul's a leader in the church, he's going all around the Mediterranean world, planning these communities, trying to get them to be, to be loyal to King Jesus and to, to behave accordingly and to start living this life of love and obedience. And the Thessalonians are doing it. They're following his advice. And so he's so thankful. He, he also, he continues to riff on this theme of the Thessalonians being great. We go down to verse 6 and 7. You Thessalonians, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. These, these Thessalonians, they didn't just hear Paul's advice and they were like, oh, that sounds good, I'll take that. Oh, man, that one I'm going to kind of leave to the side. No, they became imitators of him. Everything that he was, everything that he was doing, everything that he had cultivated in himself, they were imitating in their own lives. Not only that, they became a model to all these people throughout Macedonia and Achaia. They became an example, and I want to put that map back up just so you can see we, we labeled Macedonia and Achaia there. Literally, what he means there is all of Greece. Literally, this, this whole peninsula has heard about you, and they know who you are. And then he continues uh, in the next verse. He says, the Lord's message rang out from you not only in the Greek peninsula of Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. I, I can go, Paul says, I can go around, and I don't even have to talk about you. I don't even have to mention who you are or what you've done. Everyone already knows because that is how you've been living. That is the incredible faith that you have shown. Now, this kind of makes me think of a situation that some of you might have experienced if you're a, if you're a teacher. Is anyone a teacher here today? No? Okay, cool. Teacher, if you're a teacher, I'd imagine this scenario where you might have like this really rowdy, misbehaving class. Maybe you teach multiple classes. Maybe that's your class for the year, and you're just like, man, these people are misbehaving. They don't listen. They don't follow directions. They're not really here to learn, and it's really frustrating. But you got those like two or three students that you're like, anytime they come in the classroom, they're ready, they're prepared, they got their book open, they follow directions, they're there, they're excited to learn, they listen to what I had to say, and you're just like, okay, those two kids make it worth it. They make it worth it what I'm doing because I know that someone is getting something out of it. And I think, I think that's kind of Paul's mindset here as he thinks about the Thessalonians. He's like, man, all this crazy stuff is happening in all these churches. Read some of his other letters. There's like wild stuff that he has to address and lead through and stresses him out. But he's like, man, you guys are here for the right reasons. You guys are following directions. You guys are the ones that I am so encouraged that what I'm doing makes a difference. And so he's telling the Thessalonians this, and he's so excited about it. But the question becomes, uh, what is it exactly that this church is doing that's encouraging Paul so much? What is it exactly about their faith and their relationship with God 
that has made him so excited. Well, uh, we turn to the next, uh, the verse we're going to look at. It's verse 3. Paul says, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that Paul points out is that these Thessalonians have been producing something. They've been working hard. They've been doing stuff, and they've been enduring in the midst of challenging things. Have you ever just met someone who, their, their work ethic, just how they go about life, just it inspires you. You're like, man, I, I want to be that productive. I want to be that successful. I want to be that driven with the things that I'm passionate about. Well, these, these Thessalonians were that person. Uh, I, I think of, when I think about this theme, I think of uh, someone in our church who's on staff. Her name is Melanie Lee. Um, some of you may know Melanie, but this is a picture from a conference that our next-gen team, kids and students teams, went on this past week. She is wearing a shirt in the middle there, the white shirt that says Spiritual Gangster. I'm not exactly sure uh, what that means, but uh, she is, whatever it is. She is that, and um, she's incredible. Melanie Lee, on staff here at Grace, I see her leading meetings, in meetings, in her office, getting work done, and just her drive and her ability to, to bring people along is just incredible. I, I've never seen someone with that kind of work ethic and drive, and uh, it makes you want to be better. And Paul is saying, man, that's what I'm seeing in your church. He continues in verse 4 and 5. He says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake, for your sake, <laughs> uh, for your sake. What, what's Paul encouraging them here? Well, he's saying, guys, I've seen you with, with the Holy Spirit. I've seen you with the power of God, the presence of God coming in to your life, and you've been open to it. You've been receptive to everything God wants to do and how he wants to speak and move in your life. I'm not just glad that you're working hard and you're producing much I'm so encouraged that you have received our message and been open to all that God wants to do in you. Uh, have you ever met someone who you just, you feel like when you're with them, that God is there? <laughs> that they're just like, they have this direct access and you feel like, man, I don't, I don't know what they're going to do next, but they're going to be obedient. Whatever God tells them to do, I know it's going to happen. Well, I was thinking about this and the person that came to mind was uh, someone in our church again. Uh, her name's Portia Bryant. Portia Bryant is one of those people, when I have a conversation with her, I just feel like she is on mission for Jesus, and she's listening for his voice, and she's open to how he would want to use her. She, uh, she's written curriculum for Bible studies. She's led small groups. She's, she's a speaker and does those sorts of things, and she's very entrepreneurial, and I just, when I'm around her, I just get this expectation that God is on the move, and I love seeing that in her, and it makes me want to be more that way. Uh, the, last, uh, the last way that we see the Thessalonians kind of uh, just what they're doing that encourages Paul is here in verse 6. He says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Again, they're open to the Spirit of God, the presence of God in their midst, giving them joy. And it's not just joy, it's not just we're happy, we're excited, but it's in the midst of severe suffering. Severe suffering is happening, and they have joy in the midst of it. It's not just that they're working hard and producing much. It's not just that they're open to the Holy Spirit and his power in their midst, but it's, it's that literally they're going through hell on earth, and they have joy in the midst of it. This incredible, incredible evidence of their kind of faith and the quality of of their relationship with Jesus. When I was thinking about this one, uh, I was thinking about a couple from our church, actually, and I, I asked them if I could share a little bit about this story, but um, they're here in Norfolk, and uh, just a few years ago, they went through a miscarriage in their, their marriage, and um, it was early enough in the pregnancy that they could have very easily just kind of kept it to themselves and um, just kind of gone through it with their closest family and friends, but um, they, they didn't, and there's no like, right way or one way to grieve, and some people need to go about it a different way, but they just felt like they needed to let other people know what they had gone through and how God had met them in that. And so the, the wife, actually, I saw this Facebook post that she put online where she, she wasn't in denial about the loss and the grief um, that had happened when, uh, when they lost the baby, 
but there was this, there was this declaration in that post of, of trust in God, that God was faithful, and that he was in control. And it was just like, looking at, at, looking at that couple and how they handled that situation, I was just like, there's something different about you. There's something different that, that is not just natural. It's not just your temperament or your personality. Like, God has done something different in your heart that makes you able to say that in the midst of such severe suffering, you have joy. And it was just such, a, such an encouragement to me and, and makes me want to have that same kind of response when I experience disappointment or loss. And Paul here is saying, you Thessalonians, you guys are doing this. You guys are an encouragement to me. This is, this is amazing. And so the question was, okay, what are they doing that makes them such great examples? And then now the question becomes, okay, that's what they're doing. They're working hard. They're open to God's power. They're, they're experiencing joy in the midst of the hardest circumstances. How did they do that? <laughs> and this is where we get to this idea of a keystone habit. What, what are they doing? What's their keystone habit? What's, that the, what's at the baseline that allows them to respond to these situations in this way, to have this kind of deep faith? Um, and so we're going to dive into a few more verses and kind of finish out this chapter, uh, starting with verse 3. Verse 3, going back to, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Thessalonians were working hard. They were producing. They were enduring. But it wasn't just in their own strength. They were doing it from a certain source. They were doing it from a place of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, love in our Lord Jesus Christ, hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that referring to? What, what is that faith, hope, and love? What, what, is it, what is this reference point? What is its source? Well, as I was just thinking about this whole passage and everything, all the themes that I saw in it, I just, I just think everything is rooted in the power of the gospel. Everything is rooted in the power of the gospel. And uh, when I use the word gospel, I, don't, I know it's not a word that we use a ton, like just in everyday life, and so I just wanted to put up its definition. Gospel literally means good news. The gospel is the good news, and when I say gospel today, I'm talking about the gospel of Jesus, the gospel that says that Jesus has done something in history that has changed everything. It's, it's news. It's about historical concrete events that have happened, that God has done, and we can put our faith and our hope in that. That's what the Thessalonians were having faith in. That's what their love was rooted in. That's what their hope was in. And the way I want to summarize this gospel, this message of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, is this way today. If I had to summarize the story, the message, the good news of Jesus, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died. It's, it's this story that spans time. In the past, Jesus died for you and for me. Right now, Jesus didn't just rise from the dead back then. No, he's, he's risen and he's alive today. His presence is here with us. He's on the throne. He's ready to pour out his power even now. He has that kind of authority. And then looking forward to the future, Christ will come again. He's coming back to make everything new. And as we read through 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and as we think about the Thessalonians' faith and what we can learn from it, I think we learn that the keystone habit to following Jesus is believing the gospel. The keystone habit, we could say, of growing spiritually of growing in your relationship with God is believing the gospel, believing that Jesus came, believing that he really did die for you, believing that he is alive today and believing that he is coming again. And obviously, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've put your faith in that reality at one point, but we need to keep coming back to a deeper understanding and a deeper faith in this story that we have been wrapped up to. And I don't mean story in terms of like this fantasy, I mean a story like this reality, this, this history that you and I are a part of as human beings, that God has acted in history to make possible. And any way that you're trying to grow in your faith right now, any, any way that you're trying to take a step, overcome an obstacle, the keystone habit to seeing that happen is believing this news even more deeply. We see uh, this come up again in verse 4. Paul says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Paul declaring their identity. The Thessalonians are loved. They have been chosen. 
how has that happened? It's happened because Jesus came and rescued them, and they were welcomed into a relationship with God, not based on their own merit or their own righteousness, but because of Jesus and what he had done. And they're welcomed into the family, sons and daughters of the living God, chosen by him. That is what's fueling everything that comes after this, which is the joy in the Holy Spirit, the joy in suffering, the power of God, the deep conviction they were feeling. All of it is prefaced by the fact that they were loved by God and chosen by him, this identity that's rooted in Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. What does that equal? It equals loved. It equals chosen. And the more that you, you deeply trust and believe and put your faith in that reality, you are going to grow. And you are going to grow in that faith. Um, the last verse I want to put up here is uh, the last couple that we haven't talked about. And it's sort of where Paul sums up everything that he's heard about this church in Thessalonica. He says, They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Paul said, This is what I've heard about you. You've turned to God from idols. You've turned from the things that could distract you or that you could worship or put your hope in, money, sex, power, other gods that you can run after, all of those things their false hope. You've turned from that and you've turned to the living God, the true God, the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he set you free. He set you free. Not only that, you've, you're waiting for his son from heaven. You believe that he is coming again. You believe that he was raised from the dead and you believe that he has rescued us from the coming wrath. Think about it. Christ has died Christ has died on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin, setting us free from the idols that enslave us and allowing us to turn back into this relationship with God that we were made for. Jesus died on the cross, rescuing us from a future defined by wrath and judgment and misery. He rescued us into this life of beauty and a future of restoration, a future of life and newness. Think about it, Christ, Christ is risen right there. He's been raised from the dead. He stands reigning right now at the right hand of God, ready to intercede for you, ready to act on your behalf, ready to empathize with whatever you might be going through. And then this, this hope, Christ will come again, waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, guaranteeing that he will come one day to make everything new, everything right. The more that we see ourselves as a part of that story, that reality, the more that we are going to grow in this relationship with God. The keystone habit of following Jesus, of growing spiritually, of deepening your relationship with God is believing the gospel. And I want to put those, uh, those words, those, those phrases back up there again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's just think about this. Maybe you want to grow in your relationship with God. And you, you realize that one of the ways you want to grow is just in your forgiveness and, and reconciliation with the people around you. Maybe you have a broken relationship. Maybe it's hard for you to forgive someone for a wrong that's happened. What's the solution to that situation? What's the solution when you have someone in your life that you just do not see eye to eye when it comes to politics or when it comes to how our country or our community or your family should go? What's the solution? What's the solution when someone of a different race or ethnicity just sees the world completely differently than you do? And it's frustrating and you don't feel like you're seen or known in that place. What's, what's the solution? I think the solution is to put your faith and believe and trust more deeply in the fact that Christ has died. Jesus went to the cross. He bled so there could be unity, so that every barrier could be broken down. And he didn't just do it in this general way for humankind to be kind of kumbaya, all one. No, he did it for you and for me, for my sin, for my brokenness, for my failures and my flaws. Jesus came and didn't say, forget you, Ryan. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. You've already messed it up. No, he came and he laid down his life to bridge the gap. And that kind of love and that kind of story that I am part of makes it so I can, I can reconcile, I can forgive that's how that happens. Think about if you're, uh, if you're here and maybe you're trying to overcome a habit in your life or maybe there's some sort of um, habit 
or sin or, or flaw going on in your life that you're like, I just can't shake this, I can't get rid of it. What, what's the solution in that situation? I think the solution at the very bedrock is to believe the gospel, to believe that Christ is risen, to believe that he didn't just rise from the dead all those years ago conquering sin and death, but he's alive, reigning right now with power to give you over that habit, over that flaw, over that sin, and his presence can come into your life and his community can come around you and believe with you in his victory and help you, believing the gospel, this good news. Maybe you're, maybe you're here in a, a health challenge has just really gripped your life right now. Maybe it's a more current thing that just happened recently, um, some, some bad news, a rough diagnosis. Maybe it's something chronic that just has been struggle, you've been struggling with for years. What, what's, the, what's the hope in the midst of that? How, how do you know that you're going to be okay, that you can make it through? Christ will come again if you know that you're a part of this bigger story. Whether God heals you or not, whether it gets better or not, whether the surgery fixes it or not, you can know that you know that you know that Jesus is coming again. It's guaranteed. God raised him from the dead, giving him the keys of death and hell. He's coming back to make everything right. It's going to happen. And I can put my hope and my trust in that. And that's going to change how I go through that challenge. It's going to change how I deal with bad news. Believe the gospel. This is the keystone habit of the Christian life. And it's the keystone habit. If you're here and you're exploring a relationship with God, maybe you're not sure exactly how it all works, your next step is to understand and believe that you are a part of a story where God is the main actor. God is the hero. God is the protagonist. Maybe you've heard that the way to get to God, the way to have this relationship or, or to connect with the transcendent reality of the universe is to, to do certain things or to earn it or to behave a certain way. Maybe you've got to do a certain number of rituals or a certain you got to buy certain oils or I don't know what, all these different messages that you've got you to do to get right with God the, the, the good news that's kind of couched in some bad news is that you can't get to God. You can't do enough. You can't earn enough. You can't behave well enough to fix this incredible chasm between you and God. And so God himself took responsibility for that. And God himself came in the person of Jesus. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. And he's coming again. And your next step for a relationship with God to be one with your heavenly Father again is to trust in his sacrifice for you. And so as we, as we close today, as we wrap up uh, this first week of First Thessalonians, I want us to all have this kind of faith and relationship that the Thessalonians had, right? To have that joy, to have that power at work in our lives, to, to work from a place of joy and love and not just obligation. And so uh, at the close here, I just want everyone to stand up. Would you stand up with me? And I'm gonna pray for us. And uh, while I pray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, uh, if you feel comfortable, um, to, to open your hands up uh, in front of you. And uh, particularly if you need this gospel, this good news, to, to go deeper into your heart today. Uh, maybe it's for the first time. Maybe it's for the 10,000th time. But this is the key. <laughs> this, is, this is the baseline of all growth in following Jesus, is believing that he has come and he is victorious and he is coming back. And so I'd love to pray for us. Would you pray with me? Father, wherever we are on the journey, all of us need a deeper trust in you. Thank you, God, that you did not leave us in our idolatry and our sin, that you did not leave us in a place where we were separated from you, but you came and you did it all. Thank you that Christ has died. Thank you that Christ is risen. Thank you that Christ will come again. And I thank you that we can just filter every struggle, every challenge, every obstacle in our life through this lens. And one of those truths is going to help us process it and help us move forward. So God, in this moment with, with hands open, we are just open to you. We are open for you to give us the gift of faith and the gift of trust in you. Do what you will, Lord. Use us in whatever way you want. We are open to you, to your message, and we are living in your story. 
We are praying all of this in the hope and faith and love we find in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.